Benjamin Castle are Americans. Watching the footy. Liam Ryan saying kick it my way. I want to jump over the pack and here he comes. Oh, Ryan! This is Buddy Franklin! This is the greatest showman! Got the handball off to Myers. Myers looking for the lead of Stengel. Gee, they're good. Gee, they're sharp. Randall Dazzle Rioli. Oh, who else? McDonald. Tim From inside the centre square. Boys kick the goal. time of day everyone this is episode 176 of americans watching the footy our round 12 recap i am benjamin castle coming to you from my new place in san diego have we already used the clip about san diego repeatedly ethan use it again they named it san diego which of course in german means a whale's vagina I am Ethan Castle, coming to you from South San Francisco, California, alongside my son, Ryan Arambe, who has been attacking the bed sheets again, I saw on the call. And he tried to log me off of this call at one point. He actually, like, hit the end call button on my phone. I'm not even mad. That's amazing. Oh, I know. This is awesome. So if you hear him doing anything ridiculous, just uh, enjoy, I guess. I mean, you were able to hear his bell a good amount in our previous recording, so that shouldn't come as a surprise for our regular listeners. So this round came at an interesting time just with me moving on Thursday, driving down all the way from the peninsula to San Diego. I caught up on the first couple games in the round, and Ethan had to catch up on the Sunday action because of his schedule. So I think... The way this round probably shakes out is that Ethan has a better grip on the earlier games and I have a better grip on the later ones. Yeah, if you didn't listen to recent episodes, I was at a wedding. I have now improved my wedding to funeral ratio to one to two. And unless someone dies in the next six weeks, we're going to be at two to two soon. Uh, I also just want to make a promise. We're going to do as little discussion about Harley Reid's tackle and Rising Star stuff as possible because you can get that anywhere. I mean, we can throw in something at some point about if we think it should affect the Rising Star reward. I don't think it should. But for the brown low, you still... For the brown low, I suppose you get it. Even with some of those, though, it's tough because there are just so many suspensions being given out for tackles that wouldn't used to. I might have mentioned this. I probably did last year when dangerous tackle suspensions were really piling up. We're kind of like the Tour de France, where it's like, just finish like 15th, but don't get in trouble for steroids. And eventually, like the 14 guys ahead of you will all get popped and then you're the winner. Do you get the instant gratification? No, but you end up with a trophy. That's like, feel like you could make this joke about the Olympics as well. Oh, no. Cycling, it's way worse. I was thinking about an Olympic context because a couple Americans are going to get their medals upgraded to gold at a, a ceremony at the Paris Games. I believe it's stuff with old drug tests being re-evaluated with newer tech. Are these athletes that are failing these drug tests from Russia, perhaps? Why would you say that? Or, sorry, are they Olympic athletes from Russia? No, actually, at that point, it was still Russian Federation, and yes. Shocker. Seven games this round. We're not going to have a full nine-game round again until the very end of the month, which means probably some quicker episodes and better in-depth coverage on these games. Uh, Port Adelaide, 10-11-71, defeated by Carlton, 16-11-107. The Blues' first win over Port at the Adelaide Oval. Now they only haven't beaten the Crows there. They've won two games at the Adelaide Oval this year, which is two more than they had won ever before. I will say this, as critical as I am of that team's fan base, even with the injuries, they have a really good team that they're running out there right now. The story of this game will be that Patrick Cripps took off in the fourth quarter, and that's where they pulled away after three quarters of what played like wet weather footy, even though it was actually dry. Uh, It was a really sloppy affair that kind of surprised me as well. I saw the weather report. It looked fine, and it was just kind of inefficient, grinded out footy where just every possession seemed like a battle for so long, really 
a bit into the second half it ended up that way. And then the Blues were the cleaner team with the ball in hand, and they had the right strategy in the second half, particularly in the fourth quarter, to take advantage at center bounces. I remember Sam Walsh saying in an interview that the midfielders adjusted to keep things more on the inside, really prioritize getting front position and the first touch on center bounces and kind of work inside to out from there. And the Blues scored 7-1 from stoppages in the fourth quarter. And that's their best quarter in that regard in a decade because I'm not even going to count a game against the Eagles last year. This was very much a game where as good as Cripps was in the fourth quarter, before that, I didn't think he had been that good. Even with the double-digit disposals in the fourth, he only had 22 for the game. But he did have those first two goals in the fourth. It was really just everyone was solid. I think there's an argument to be made that the best player from start to finish in this game was actually Jason Horn Francis. There he is again, the horny one! But Carlton did not have a single bad player in this game. They subbed out Orazio Fantasia. Orazio Fantasia. I thought he actually was playing just fine, even though he missed a shot at one point. He still ended up with like 10 disposals. I think it was just a more like a like for like, let's get some fresh legs in sub. And I would at this point put Jack Carroll in over him in the first place. I think Vantage is an easy one to take out. I wouldn't be shocked if he gets demoted when these next pieces come back, particularly when Jesse Motlop comes back in, which could be as early as next week. You know I like Jesse Motlop, but also I am always going to go for the guy whose name sounds so cool. But like you look at the guys who had low possession numbers in this game, and I thought every single one of them impacted the game positively on some stage other than, well, it's hard to really consider Carroll because he only played a quarter, but Lockie Cowan, seven disposals, super high work rate, used a lot of speed. Mitch McGovern only had nine disposals, but was great defensively, snuck forward and kicked a goal. I want to highlight Ollie Hollins for his pressure, eight tackles. I love how the two Hollins brothers are both going at this point. I do and I don't. I don't because it's really hard for me to distinguish between them. You know, I really? think out Josh and Jake Kelly, which Hollins was already at Carlton. Ollie? Ollie, number four. And Elijah was the one who was in love with the Coco, right? Yes, number 20. Or at least had a good relationship with the Coco. I don't know if they were in love. Good enough that it cost him a couple of years on his contract. Okay, so I do know that Elijah's 20 and that Ollie's four. It's going to take me a while to remember that Elijah's the one who was at the Suns, though. But we're getting there. But, like, Lockie Fogarty was super active, even though he only had, what, 13 disposals. Alex Chincotta, a goal and 13 disposals and four clearances. Chincotta successful in tagging Zach Budras. I think that's the first time that he's been successfully tagged this year. So see if Chincotta does try to continue as a tagger. I want to highlight, though, Fogarty, along with someone else who was around the same number of touches, that being Zach Williams. I noticed the two of them really making sure that Kane Farrell and Dan Houston could get up to players who had marked for overlaps. This was a problem that we'd mentioned for a couple weeks now, if not longer, where these two players would just keep getting opportunities to overlap and put on their long kicks. You saw it really in Port's three wins ahead of this against the Cats, Hawks, and Kangas. And finally, a team did the right thing and paid attention to him. And lo and behold, they won. Some people really rated Tom DeConing highly for the eight clearances. I thought he and Yvonne Soldo was a fun matchup, actually. Nice to see Soldo back in there and not just because he's on my fantasy team. Oh, yeah. And you actually had to use him this week. Yeah. I mean, I had him as an emergency and then no Jared Witts. Interesting ruck matchup. I do believe DeConing got the better of that in the end. Two rucks that have full field ability, and you saw that from both of them, particularly from DeConing, and the six score launches were very telling as well. I think DeConing won the bookend quarters, and Soldo won the middle quarters. I think it's hard to argue against Carlton winning anything in terms of the fourth quarter in the first place, considering they doubled their goal total in that quarter alone. A couple other things I was noticing. The power put on some really aggressive kicks from halfback, and it was high risk, high reward. So when they had their better bones, it was because they were going quickly and aggressively. And when it comes to Port's actual defense, I did not recognize Asava Radagolea, even once I saw his number. 
I'm not usually in a position to criticize haircuts, but he went somewhere between completely going shaved head and a buzz cut, and that doesn't work. You got to pick one or the other. It just looked strange being so used to what he looks like. He did have a more typical Asava game this week. I had another... Well, it wasn't goal line, it was goal square issue. He kind of just flailed trying to stop the Crips goal that put Carlton up 13 on the opening minute of the fourth quarter. Just, I'm sorry, how was Crips left alone there? He was left alone on the next one. There it was. It was in less than 90 seconds of clock time. I just don't get how you don't, you don't have someone manned up with him off the stoppage any time. I don't know whose responsibility that was, but that was a clear miss there. The Blues also responded well after not being able to convert on their early entries in the third quarter. They were no goals, two for their first seven inside 50s in the third. After giving up a goal, they immediately responded through Harry Mackay, and they were on the right page from there. Do you have the West Mantus clip? I'm sorry. Ron's rival in Anchorman. As a San Diegan, you should know this. It'll be more fitting assuming we lose to the Blues in a couple weeks. Deep down in my stomach, with every inch of me, I pure, straight, hate you. But God damn it, do I respect you. Are people going to be cheering for a draw in the King's Eve game now as well? I don't know. What I do know is the attendance figures, I think they're going to smash a lot of their attendance records for that game. I think 90,000 is not out of the question. Well, okay, they had 83, 638 last year. So if they don't get at least 86 or 87, I'd be shocked. No rain in the forecast will be chilly, but no rain. You want to talk attendance, though? I think this is a good round to talk about it, especially as we pivot to the Friday night game. Collingwood 12-10-82 defeated by the Western Bulldogs 15-10-100. This game was at Marvel and got over 43,000, whereas the game at the G the next day got just over 36. Now, I know that Collingwood had that two games on their contract to play there, and that Craig Kelly is considering kind of setting up hubs in the Gold Coast or maybe even out west for future years. And I know that Hawthorne had just played at Marvel the previous week, but this all just doesn't seem right in terms of where the AFL actually wants to put games. And it's also complicated by the fact that they own that stadium. You know, you can't just make it games against non-Victorian teams at Marvel. Everyone's supposed to play at the G over the course of the year, whether that's written into a contract or not. But I feel like a game against such a Not one of the biggest clubs, but a team that's been pretty strong for a while, the Bulldogs, who are usually a pretty good draw, you would think that would be one you'd put at the G. So basically this game, you know what we said about Patrick Cripps in the fourth quarter? Take that and multiply it by like a million, and that was Bob's fourth quarter in this game. A goal off 14 disposals, impacting the game, not just in the midfield, but in both 50s. This was him at his best. You thought Nick Dacos' first quarter was one thing? Six center clearances in that quarter alone. I don't know how close that is to a record, but it's got to be. And then somehow bought up the ante with his fourth. Um, I made a meme from this game. You know the dad, why is my sister's name Rose meme? Because your mom loves roses. No problem, Marcus Bonham Pelly's fourth quarter on May 31st, 2024. Both teams were shorthanded. And I don't know how much having Jordan to go or Scott Pendlebury would do to take out and Pelly because he can go off against literally anybody, but I'm sure it would have helped. Uh, Pendlebury's going to be out, what, a month plus now? The arm injury is going to keep him out at least until their round 15 bye. It's not just that he was going for the game's record. He had been playing really, really well over that past month, when at the start of the year he had a little finish. How much do you think they felt his absence of this game? Could you really feel it? I don't know. Again, I don't know how much it would have done to stop and Pelly because when he's like that, I don't think anything can stop him. Maybe it would have helped on Adam Trelor, who had a pretty nice game as well. He didn't, not only was he super high possession, uh, second only Bonham Pelly, 11 clearances and only eight turnovers. And when more than half of your possessions are contested, eight turnovers out of 37 disposals is not that bad. But also there was more to this game. Uh, Collingwood should have been up huge after a quarter. They had 12 scoring shots to five and kicked five, seven and had just a 17 point lead. Turned into a great back and forth second quarter. Collingwood pulled ahead, led 81 to 69 at three quarter time. Nice. And then got outscored 31 to one the rest of the way and just 
you know, I think this really was a case of a team that's playing shorthanded. So we got both teams dealing with injuries. I'd say the dogs actually had a worse in game because they ended up a man down for the second half. Pretty early on, James Harms did his hamstring. So the sub was used within 15 minutes or so of time on. And then Latham Vandermeer went down with a hamstring of his own near half time. So the dogs were playing a man down for all the second half and they still lifted in the contest. They still dominated from stoppage for really the final three quarters. They scored 45 points from stoppage and that's the second worst performance for Collingwood in that respect for this year. A lot of it was from Bontempelli beating Nick Dacos, but also Tremor, Hardy Gallagher with 12 contested possessions, one of their more important pressure players in the forward two thirds. Bit of a resurgence for him after a quieter past month or so. Look what happens when you actually let a young guy that your club is high on play. Uh, speaking of, Riley Sanders, I thought was pretty good. He was another one who was willing to get super physical, but only 15 disposals, 11 tackles. Is that a recipe for being dropped when Liva comes back? It really shouldn't be. And yet. Well, actually, I think maybe Vandermeer's injury will give him a reprieve. Dogs will have to do some forward shuffling, though, because Sam Darcy's being suspended for two games for his contact he put on Braden Maynard. Last year, he might have not had nearly as much of a case to answer, but now he definitely does, and the dogs have accepted that. So no Darcy, no Aaron Naughton. Will require Jamar Hagen to lift more. Rory Lobb, I imagine, would be called on again too. It's funny how Lobb is wanting out now. All of a sudden, he's going to have this pretty sizable role for at least these couple weeks here heading into the bye. I do not blame Lobb, though. Simply put, he is too good to be in the VFL, and he's on a list that's now crowded with a bunch of very good talls. His responsibility, though is just make sure that the situation doesn't bring down like team chemistry or anything, you know? As long as he does that, he'll be well within his rights as a player to want to be in a situation that gives him an opportunity. And maybe you'll see him having to go back as a defensive 50 mark as well. That was another one of the things that Sam Darcy was able to do. And we've seen Love have that capability as well. It may require also another strong marking game from some of the younger players at Joel Frazier and James O'Donnell. And I think Alex Keith was actually pretty good. He, there were some times when the Bulldogs started to mount pressure that he kind of pushed forward, you know, kind of got up to the midfield and ensured that Collingwood couldn't get it beyond midfield and sent it back in. Lockie Bramble was basically invisible. And I know, I know they're totally different players, but if you're looking at just who's your weakest defender that you could take out to get Buku Kamas in, he would be that guy, even though you'd have like the craziest line of talls ever. Kamas or maybe Jed Buslinger, their first round pick from 2022, a Western Australia native who has yet to get a game and has been showing well in the twos. That's another one where I hope he wants out and requests to come home and wear blue and gold. Have you ever seen him and Sam Barry in the same place? Jet Buslinger and Sam Barry? You see the resemblance, right? Sam Barry actually kind of crossed with Bontempelli. They play each other round 22. There is no way they both play in that game. Okay, we also thought that there was no way that both Mackays would make it through this week. Hey, there's still time. There's still time. Uh, they did an interview together today. Okay, there's been a rift then. Darcy Cameron did fine as the sole Ruckman. 51 hit outs, so one more than Tim English, and they each had 16 disposals. You know, Tim English has been just okay this year. I've been expecting more out of him. Uh... Riley Garcia had a bunch of early turnovers and then really improved. He was still kind of a loose cannon, but I liked the way he played. I thought Liam Jones was really good in the second half. And then with Collingwood positive, Josh Dacos' his first quarter, negative, he kind of faded after that. If they can get a game where both he and Nick are clicking the whole way, I don't know how you're going to stop them. The, you know, they kind of just stopped themselves by not capitalizing by kicking 5-7 there. Uh, Lockie Schultz kicked 3-2, and he caught a lot of crap earlier this year. I think he deserves to be recognized for having his best game so far for them. And if he can parlay this into another good performance this coming week, I think we can say, all right, he's back, and he's going to have a good second half of the season. And it's then say KFC. I love the obvious product placement sign. I think I like that even more than the Hungry Jacks flag. The, the thing is, it, it looked like so piecemeal and homemade. You could see, like, the clear break in the papers there. 
if that was product placement, then they could have done with uh, an actually better sign. And if it was product placement also, I want to know how much they paid the guys. And then I also noticed, yeah, this is a team that's missing a couple important defenders right now. And Charlie Dean and Will Parker have a lot to learn positioning-wise. Uh, Parker, you know, it makes sense. He was playing cricket until not long ago. There were a lot of former cricketers in this game. They mentioned this three category Bs that had been cricketers. Alex Keith, James O'Donnell, and Will Parker. I would hope that Collingwood would bring in Nathan Murphy, honestly, into their coaching staff as a defensive assistant because he could teach a lot regarding positioning. Just the way that he and Darcy Moore were able to play off each other as two just super effective talls. That's something that the Pies are definitely missing right now. And who better to learn from than the guy who did it so well himself? I'm thinking of that because I want players to be able to be connected with clubs after their careers in more occasions. And honestly, here's another smooth transition here. One club that has done that very well with uh, an early retirement is Hawthorne because who is their MC, Ethan? Max Lynch, who is really funny. Maximum Lunch on Instagram. I believe it was the Hawk Talk guys who said, OK, he's got to listen to us because he called Jack Scrimshaw the Scrim Reaper. That is an excellent nickname, and Scripshaw had a solid start in the Hawks. 27-point win over the Crows, 16-11-107, defeating Adelaide 12-8-80. It was Jack Gunston's 250th. He got the attention he deserved. He is not super comfortable with the spotlight. He's just very much a supporting cast forward, but he got his three goals. Dylan Moore targeted him late. And the whole team got in all the celebration. James Sicily just tried to jump on top of like the standing equivalent of a dog pile. And he just fell off and looked super silly. Gunston, by the way, is the 16th player. Thank you to Swamp for this to score goals in his debut. And then his 50th, 100th, 150th, 200th and 250th games. There's something to be said about players lifting for milestones and teams just being very aware of them and often getting players, you know, some extra possessions once the game's already decided in either direction. And for the Hawks, this was a game that they controlled from the beginning. Could have been up a lot more after the first. They were up 20, but their 34 was five goals four. That celebration with Sicily falling off reminds me of an iconic baseball moment. After a walk-off during the 2012 playoffs, Cliff Pennington kind of fell out of the dog pile and kind of had a one-man dog pile. And like a fan-made, like cheesy, cheap meme template, Cliff Pennington, master of the one-man dog pile, was actually hung up in the A's clubhouse. Cut 4 had a story on it. Cliff Pennington is the creator of the one-man dog pile. Was this after the falsy scream? Yes. I miss Ray Falsey for that scream alone, and there's a lot of other things for which he, he should be missed. I really miss the questions he would ask. The Ray Fossey interview is a beautiful thing where basically you ask a question that takes 45 seconds to ask, and then you include the answer to it somewhere within the question, and at the end you just get a response to something like, uh, what? Hawthorne had control of this game from the beginning, and what did Adelaide do to change things in the first three quarters? Nothing! Now get out! There are teams below the Crows on the ladder. Well, there is a team below the Crows on the ladder that I am not ready to give up on yet. And that's the Saints, because they're just good at proving me wrong. I am giving up on the Crows for 2024. Even though they're still even with the Lions, are you giving up on the Lions as well, or is it just the Crows? Nope. Remember, the Lions also have a game in hand now. Also, if I recall, and I'm going to pull it up right now, the Crows' remaining schedule is not friendly. Yeah, I think we went over this before. It does not look pretty. Yeah, it's very not friendly. Um, if they lose the round 23 showdown, do they say, fuck the extension, Matthew Nix is gone? I mean, we saw a team give an extension last year and still fire the guy. I guess it comes down to, you know, who else you have as a candidate because you don't have Damian Hardwick waiting there. Yeah, it's one of those like, I need to know what's behind door number two type situations. I'm just really disappointed in the Crows. I am also getting to the point, as much as I like the way Hawthorne plays and the way they're doing this rebuild, 
I am beginning to resent them. I'm feeling a rivalry. You'll really see it when they beat Geelong at Cardinia Park. I don't know if they do that, but we will not dominate them on Easter Monday for years to come. They're doing this the right way. Um, again, jumped on them from the start, was a 29-point lead at halftime, felt like it could have been more, even though the Crows had kind of settled into that second quarter, and then three very quick goals to open the third, one in each of the first three minutes of clock time, and that really put it out of reach. The score made it look more competitive than it was. It was an everywhere game for Dylan Moore, 5-1 off 27, 12 score involvements and two assists as well. I don't know how it has taken so long for people to realize, oh yeah, this guy should be in all Australian half forward consideration. His kicking accuracy hadn't been there at times. Yeah, this is a team that struggled with set shot kicking and just general goal kicking altogether for a while. Well, when the Hawks are clicking just in terms of movement and generating scoring shots in general, Moore is one of the big reasons why forward of the center square, and sometimes he gets in there as well, less so since Will Day has come back in, and Day's inclusion, he had two assists as well in a 23 disposal effort. Will Day just makes everyone around him better. Plugs, whatever hole he's required to plug, Jai Nukem has been better since he's been back in, and that's been really noticeable. Connor Nash has had to do less heavy lifting as well. The Hawks have turned around their center bounce play so much since Day came back and just the difference between the first six weeks and these past six is part of the pun, night and day. This midfield with Day in it just looks so much better because at the start of the year, it was really just James Warple. The Hawks were the worst team in terms of center clearance differential and center bounce score differential in the first six rounds. And now they're middle of the pack, if not better. I think they're sixth in terms of center bounce scoring differentials. I think I saw that in one of the Fox footy shows that I was watching. It all just makes sense. The Hawks have always been a strong pressure team. They collapse around the ball really well. And now with good structure in the center bounces, it's all coming together for them. And they are unafraid to take some risks out of center bounce as well. You contrast that with the Crows who played far too safely and again, did not see any magnets move really aside from Max Michelani going into the middle somewhat in the fourth quarter which is an interesting move and one that I would approve if they were healthier in defense, but they're not. And they need his help moving the ball as well, considering Brody Smith is not capable of doing it as he once was. At the start of the year, I liked Smith as kind of a long, accurate kick with good vision. Similar to Jordan Dawson, uh, he's been pretty poor the last few weeks, Smith. Um, his, his turnovers have gotten pretty bad, starting to show some signs of age. He was not the only player from a South Australian team to show that this week. I can't believe I forgot to mention, kind of zigzag around here back to the first game. Uh, Charlie Dixon got subbed out with one disposal. I'm not going to go like the sky is falling, he's finished. Because just like as a physical presence, Dixon still, you know, impacts your defensive structure as an opponent. He's going to get into marking contests, but he's starting to show some wear and tear. Um, and now we're going to connect this. You know who else impacted marking contests without actually taking many marks? Cal Deer. How's that for a segue? Not bad, not bad. I thought you were actually going to veer into talking about Taylor Walker getting subbed out with a back problem if you're talking about kind of central forward figures for the South Australian teams. That's a notable one there. Jordan Dawson was also not playing at 100%. Speaking of him, he was going through tests on his foot before the game. So that's another thing to factor in there. But regardless, the Crows just played too safely and too slowly off at times. They got blown up in terms of conceding from turnovers in the midfield. They couldn't make anything in terms of possessions that started from their back 50. Nothing really worked from this game. I mean, we gave James Borlase the polished turn because just he was the one thing that actually was consistent there in defense. And that's where the Crows kind of had to live. Matt Crouch had high possession numbers, but didn't. It was kind of a Shania Twain. Have I have I made this reference? I think I have. So you got 35 disposals, nine marks, seven clearances, and seven tackles. That don't impress me much. And now you're out for the season. Is it for the season? AC joint injury, season-ending shoulder surgery. This broke a couple hours ago. I knew it was an AC joint. I did not know it was season-ending. Yeah, I actually kept that from you just to see how you'd 
react live. Crouch ends up being a, a big possession getter, but maybe not as much impact per touch. Maybe this will require some more time in the guts from Dawson to help make up for it. Or maybe they actually pull the trigger and give Billy Dowling a debut at last. I thought Rory Laird, this was one of his games where his numbers were high. I wasn't all that impressed. They got beat in the middle. I don't care what the disposal numbers were. Watch this game. Hawthorne was clearly the better midfield team. And uh, credit to Ned Reeves for hanging in there with Riley O'Brien. Yeah, we'll see how long Boyd Meek is out, but Reeves did enough there. And I want to see him continue to get into some forward half marking contest to see if he can really be worth an inclusion still, even with Meek coming back. I, it seems like a pretty minor syndesmosis issue there that could see him back as early as this week. I'm liking Jake Saligo more and more. He was probably their best midfielder, even though I don't think he was that good. Uh, James Borlase, like as I was the the main positive. Um, second week in a row, I know last week you recognized him for the Hawks. This week it's my turn, and I'm still waiting. We need BT to get one of their games just so we can say it. Massimo D'Ambrosio is a really accurate kick and kind of stretches the field some. I think he plays off of Carl Amon. Like, a good chain for the Hawks starts with Amon and then goes to Massimo and then moves forward from there. Uh, also, this was the frost volleyest game they've had this year, and they overcame it. That was one of the reasons things got a little bit closer. Sam Frost was very Sam Frost, but, it, you know, he picked a good day to do it. So Hawthorne, similar to Carlton, I do not like you, but I respect the hell out of how you're playing. You know, the jazz musician Thelonious Monk once said, a genius is the one most like himself. Is Sam Frost a genius then? I don't know about him. I definitely am then. North Coast Brewing, speaking of Thelonious Monk, has a Belgian-style ale called Brother Thelonious. Excellent. Also, you know what Thelonious Monk's middle name was, Ethan? Ooh, I just saw it. Weird. I wish you hadn't looked it up. I'm sorry. I'm not really sorry. West Coast Eagles 10-8-68, defeated by St. Kilda 12-10-82. The Eagles led at each of the three quarter breaks. And then the Saints controlled things in the fourth. Five goals to two. Hello, Mason Wood. Wood. When Max King was subbed out with a knee injury, Mason Wood put up his hand, went forward, and controlled batters in the fourth quarter. Ended up sealing the game. 22 disposals at eight marks in addition to his four goals straight. This is the kind of stuff that I think people saw when he was at North. With his ability to rove and move into the forward half, he, he went from the wing into a key forward spot and was the game winner. The Eagles did get tired. You, you could tell in the end that they were without Tim Kelly and Jake Waterman. It still though confused me why the game swung away from the Saints in the final segments of each of the first three quarters. That's something that I really am not able to explain there, especially because West Coast had such a hard time getting numbers back off of the turnovers that they gave up themselves. You know, I can't say I watched this game super closely. I'm going to, for the sake of our awards, go back and do that in the next 24 hours. I think it's kind of appropriate as an open question, though, because I, I didn't really see any one person answer that thus far, just any analysis that I've seen. You know, Hawthorne's been the club that has had trouble closing out quarters most of the time. They've done much better in that the past couple of weeks. Now it's shifting a bit toward the Saints for no clear reason to me. This seemed like a game that, you know, we thought this could have been a Sickos game. It, I don't think it was. I think that's fair to not call it a, a Sickos game. I think it was, you know, a maybe a low average to average quality game in terms of actual talent. But in terms of entertainment, yeah, I don't think this was quite sickos. Entertainment was there. Watchability. And not just because of Harley Reid, but also because of Harley Reid. Especially Lisa, but especially Bert. We talked about the suspension already. I want to focus less on what he actually did and more on what the Saints did to stop him. It was the first time we really saw him get tagged this well, and it's something they should have done from the beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, Marcus Windhager. They did the obvious thing. That's they did the obvious thing in the second half. Why Windhager was attacking him from the jump, I did not understand. Because Reed got irritated. 
he got fined for a couple times, I think for like umpire descent and contact, in addition to his suspension, which the Eagles are trying to lower to one game. Remember last year, there were there were times when Winhager like couldn't even get in the team. I could tell he was viewed as an important player going into this year because they gave him number two. That's a number that's had a lot of history at the club, especially with Danny Frawley and also Nick Revolt. So that was a big vote of confidence in him. And then he's given them reason to continue believing in him with the general efforts that he's been able to put on, including his ability as a tagger. He limited Reed to, I think, three touches and no clearances when he had 17 and seven clearances in the first. I am not sure with Windhager doing this. Is it a sign that keeping him out of the team at times in past years and developing him was correct? Or is it a sign that he should have been in sooner? I think it's a sign that he should have been in sooner. I think so, because I don't think he's changed that much as a player between then and now. I mean, I think he's got a little bit more refined as a player, but hasn't really changed who he is in terms of being that tagging midfielder that we come to expect. It was a slow start for Jack Steele that he worked into the game quite nicely in the last three quarters. He actually was all zeros in the first, and I was wondering, did Dom Sheed actually do something? But he, of course he couldn't lock him down for the full game. Still, though, just like quietly pleased with Sheed this game compared to some other ones. Also, I want to declare the Leah Ryan halfback experiment completely dead. 3-2 from 11 and just entertaining again as that forward target. Keep him in there as that small target with Waterman coming back in, with Oscar Allen coming back in, maybe straight away after the bye. That I'm really looking forward to because I want to see how he and Waterman play off each other. Hopefully it means Waterman has more of a roving job, kind of a Jeremy Cameron-like thing where he keeps getting involved kind of on the halfback flank at times in terms of moving out of defense. And I think having him in there could also help provide some extra numbers there in case things do go wrong because the Eagles defense just looked lazy outside of a couple key pieces and a couple odd moments for others. And that explained a lot of their trouble. As I said earlier, they were not able to get numbers back off turnovers. The midfield, I don't think, did well enough to assist the defense as well. Maybe that's another reason why they're missing Tim Kelly. Just looking at the numbers defensively, things look good for Tom Barris and Jeremy McGovern. Yeah, you want to talk about the couple key pieces there? That's kind of what they are week in and week out. Credit to the Saints for taking advantage off turnovers, especially in their forward half and being the stronger pressuring team because the Eagles haven't been able to do well at that. Ruben Jimmy did as much as he could in that regard again, 12 contested and eight tackles for him. But this was a slightly undermanned team. I was impressed that they held on to the lead for as long as they did, but I did expect the Saints to win this even before the Waterman and Kelly outs were confirmed. I didn't until those outs. This just seemed like, just looking at the numbers, a lot of contested possessions. Kind of a grimy, high-pressure game. I think the Eagles did it to themselves a lot of the time. They're a team that likes to go more uncontested from the back, but they weren't as clean by foot as in some prior games. You know, Benjamin, 78% of our listeners are between 18 and 35 years old, so they probably want to start a podcast like we did. How did you know that number, Ethan? Thanks to the analytics we have for Spotify for Podcasters. Formerly known as Anchor, sorry for your fans, Spotify for Podcasters has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast from your phone or your computer. No fancy software needed. It's so easy you can edit it while drunk. And Spotify for Podcasters doesn't just allow you to upload to Spotify, you can also distribute your podcast on platforms like Apple, Stitcher, and more just like we do. Best of all, it's completely free. Not only is it free, you can even make money from listener support or ad revenue. Hint, hint. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to podcasters.spotify.com to get started today. Welcome back to episode 176 of Americans Watching the Footy. Once again, I'm Ethan Castle. You can find me on Twitter at Castle Media. I am Benjamin Castle. Find me at BenjaminHK01. Collectively, we are at Americans Footy on various social platforms. I imagine most of you already follow us on at least one of those, most likely Twitter. If not, follow us there to get our thoughts as the round goes on. We're going to try something new here right now. Uh... It's one of those things where the title doesn't exactly explain what we're doing. So I'm going to have to spell it out, but I'm calling this segment Ethan and Benjamin react in real time to coaches' votes. 
So I, I know that definitely does not explain at all what we're about to do. But up until what, like round 16 or so, coaches vote, get released to the public after each round, Sunday here, Monday in Australia. Yeah, it's usually around 4 p.m. Monday Melbourne time. So 11 p.m. Sunday for us. Well, let's start looking at these uh, game by game. Let's just scroll down and look at the very first game. Okay, DeConing is higher than I would have put. Horn Francis a little lower, but nothing outlandish. A little surprised Alir got in and surprised Newman only got one, but nothing insane. Walsh 9 does kind of resonate with me. I think he had the right thing going in terms of strategy as well. Okay, if they did it right for um, Pies and Dogs, then it should probably be Bond 10, Dacos 8. Nick, that is. Shit, we were semi-close. To, actually, we weren't that close to a perfect ballot. We had disagreements on who the third best player was. And somehow both had Trelore as fourth best. I think Trelore was a pretty clear third, and I don't think Dale, despite his high disposal numbers, was that impactful. That seems like a beverage vote. But Bond 10, Dacos 8 is correct. All right. Uh, first game Saturday. Let's see. Wow, some love for Ginnivan. I probably wouldn't have gone that high with him. Whoa, yeah. oh, dang it, we were so close. More Newcomb Day, that makes sense. Uh, I'm I'm glad Borlase got one. You know, it's not often you recognize a defender when a team gives up triple digits, but he was good. I think that validates our polished turd vote even more, but we were so close to one of my favorite types of votes, the 10 5 5 5 5 Now, there's also a world where we can, I mean, I don't, I'm sure it's never happened, but just Five guys all get six votes. All right, Eagles game, we ready? Yeah, I think Wood's got to be high. The Zaya probably pretty high. Yes, but the... Ooh, this is a weird one. Elliot, Yo, and Leah. Okay, Adam Simpson gave Liam Duggan three. It, it, he has to have just gotten three from somebody, yeah, because the... And then I guess one of Yo or Wilkie got like a four and a one, and the other got a three and two. And then I think Naziah must have gotten... Hang on, I'm going to figure this out. All I know is that I would fire Adam Simpson just for continuing to give Liam Duggan votes. We know that Dow and Ryan each got one. We know that Duggan got three, and he had to just get a three from somebody. So we can map out the rest from there. Now, the fours might have made things interesting. No, 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 no. Hang on. I think this makes no sense. I'm so confused. Did Naziah get both fours? Yeah, okay. I think I've mapped this out. Naziah got both fours, and one of Yo and Wilkie got a straight five, and the other got a three and a two. This is one of the strangest coaches' vote distributions I think I've seen. Now we have to figure out which coach did what. We're pretty convinced that Duggan got the three from Simpson, and I think Wood got a five from Simpson going off the logic that you rated him very highly watching the game through an Eagles lens. And I think, honestly, then... Ross Lyon gave Cal Wilkie a straight five, and Adam Simpson did not include him at all. I think both of these are nonsense. Ross Lyon's ballot most likely goes Wilkie five, Nazia four, Yo three, Wood two, Dow one. Fitting the Ross Lyon Sim- the guy who kicked four goals down at two. And then Simpson would have given Mason Wood five, Nazia four, Duggan three. I want to go to Perth and whack him He's over the head for that alone. I like- I, he just wants to rationalize making him a co-captain. And then Yo2 and Ryan won. So both coaches turned in something incredibly silly. Um, Gordon, Beat Gordon, pointed out to us on Twitter, well, pointed out to everybody that Jack Crisp earned the title of Coach's MVP for his double-digit tackles, etc. And yet he didn't get a single coach's vote. Also, Marcus Windhager didn't get a single coach's vote. Shenanigans. Dicknanigans. There's no way any other coach's votes are going to give us this much pause, right? Between the math that needed to be done and the sheer silliness of all of this, I'm going to guess the rest make more sense. I know there are only like two tens given out this entire round, and I think we already got through those. Uh, Geelong Richmond, let's see. Wow, Max Holmes rated way higher than I had him. Max Holmes and there are no Tom Atkins. Liam Baker polished third call, good. Oh, we got some more weird math for the Melbourne Frio votes. You know, he's had great fantasy value, but most games he hasn't had that much, you know, that level of game impact. And this definitely wasn't one of those, but. Okay, I think I figured this out already. Tracy and Young got a five each. Jordan Clark got both fours. Switkowski and Sarong got a three and a one each. And Pierce and Jackson each got twos. Ooh, actually, yeah, I think you're right. 
Yeah, because there's no other way Switkowski and Sarong could have added up to four. There's no way one of them could have had a straight four. I remember there was a game, I think it was last year, where the only thing on which coaches could agree was that... It was Geelong and North, I believe. Yeah, I think the only thing on which coaches could agree was, yes, Tom Atkins was definitively the third best player on ground. All right, and then last game, hey, more love for Mac Andrew. Okay, haven't seen the Suns-Bombers game in full. We'll get to that later, but I'm a little surprised, based off of what I have seen, that Tuke Miller didn't pull better. A lot of turnovers, I'll say that. All right. So the Saints-Eagles game did have some sicko stuff, just not where we thought it would be. Instead, the sicko stuff came in the form of coaches' votes. So going over to Saturday night, Jack Bowes definitely did lift. Geelong, 15-9-99, defeating Richmond, 10-9. Nice. This first half was uh, a difficult watch, even for somebody who was a third party here. I posted a meme that's actually gotten really good play. It's the Minnesota Vikings thing from a couple years ago. I don't think it started with them, did it? I don't think it did, but it just makes me think most of the 2022 Minnesota Vikings with all their one score wins. But yeah, this game was definitely that. Wow, this even got bookmarked five times. Wow, I'm honored. This is good. This game was also that meme of, you know, the guys looking out the window on the bus, depending on how you look at the first half and how you look at the second half. Geelong entered this with some really weird lineup decisions and didn't play many midfielders, you know, with Mark Blitzovs and Jai Clark both suspended. Instead of bringing in Mitch Hardy or Brandon Parfit, uh, Mark O'Connor came back in and he did actually play with some physicality. And then Gary Rowan was the sub, which turned out fortuitous because Ollie Henry got hurt. It was hamstring awareness. So that seems like a simple one for next week. You know, I've been banging the Mitch Hardy drum. I've been yelling for... Connor O'Sullivan to get in. I would like to see Parfit back in there. But the lineup decisions that I questioned, at least in the second half, ended up working out. And I will give a lot of credit. This was the best game that Jack Henry has played. Maybe the Carlton game, considering what he was up against, maybe he was better. But this was his most consistent start to finish four quarter performance, and it was badly needed. Nonetheless, terrible first half for most of the team. Down 16 at the break and then turned it around with a six goal to three third quarter, and then won the fourth quarter 28 to one to put it away. The second half was more like what I expected against what is just a decimated Richmond team that, to their credit, played super hard. If they can go out and give the Crows a game this week, I will feel much more encouraged. They don't have to win, but they have to compete. If they do that, I will actually feel like, yeah, all right, you know, this seems to be like, you know, the scrappy Tigers, like, they're going to lose, but they're going to knock out some teeth on their way there and probably tear another ACL. And this one I'm really sad about. Yeah, Michael T. Lafau is the fifth ACL victim on Richmond this year. It's the opposite ACL to the one that he had torn a couple years ago while playing in the reserves. This objectively sucks. This objectively makes Richmond far less exciting to watch, even with Shane Bolton coming back in next week. Lafau was probably our favorite story coming out of the preseason. He was a player. You will- that- Yes, this is another one where I alerted you to him based on vision from the preseason hitouts. It was the game against Melbourne where I really noticed him getting physical and the whole team following with that whole vibe that he gave. He ended up being the most prominent of the tall targets for Richmond this year because, you know, they still haven't had Tom Lynch. Noah Balta has stayed back and he belongs there. He has done a great job for their defensive structure, and I want to give him a lot of credit. Um, Things that were good for Richmond in this game. Well, LaFau, until he went down, how many? So he finishes this first season with 14 goals from 10 games. I referred to him as a big ball of muscle. There was one where he was kind of fighting. It was almost like, you know, a rugby scrum where he was just like fighting to get this ball across the goal line. And I think finally Cola Jash, and he was able to touch it through from the behind. But Liam Baker played a great first half and then good adjustments to shut him down. It was actually a game for Noah Cumberland to build off. Had a couple of really nice contested marks. And that was one of the reasons I was really concerned. Because most Geelong losses, especially home losses, there are moments of like, really, we're getting beat by this guy? And Noah Cumberland, who I know for the play against Frio. The play on. That was very frustrating. The way the second half went... To me, it looks like uh, one team that was very much out of their depth and playing a lot of young guys that just haven't learned yet how to run out full games. 
it seemed um, inevitable that the cats would end up getting on top of things. I was worried, though, because of the patterns in that first half. One player who did mention that I think really deserves some attention, and I think some fans have given it to him, especially some Richmond fans of the past few weeks, is one of their debutants for this year, Kane McAuliffe, who has looked really sharp going through the middle in the first half, knows when to bring the physicality. He can't quite run out games yet, but he's got plenty of time to develop. I don't try to look too much at final margin, but considering that there weren't, you know, garbage time scores, this is a team that you should be probably beating by eight or nine goals at least, not five. And again, credit to Richmond for playing their asses off, but it was a terrible first half made better by a good second half. I don't know why it took so long to get it figured out, but I think someone realized whether it was through like a nice, relaxed discussion and a calculated adjustment or just yelling at people that, you know, you need to get clearances. And then all of a sudden, Jack Bowes and Tom Atkins got center clearances. They looked unbelievably slow. I was thinking, you know, like, it's time to drop Atkins, even if it's just for a week, just to send a message because he's so well-liked. I think it would really get a point across. And then he proved his worth in the second half. Ollie Dempsey kicked three goals and then got a bunch of the ball late. I thought Mitch Duncan played pretty well. Just a lot of, like, line drive kicks on point. I would still like to see, though, even with the stoppage success they had in the second half, I would like to see Brandon Parvin and Mitch Hardy brought back in. I think there are a few pieces that you could move around to make that work. I think dropping Oshin Ball to maybe putting Zach Tui in a sub role could be the answer for that because Tui didn't do all that much until the fourth quarter because he's that sort of late game clutch player still sometimes. So a way that you can shift things around and only have Mark O'Connor in if he's going to be a tagger and you've got somebody to tag next week. It's Isaac Heaney. And you could also make an argument to tag Chad Warner. The other thing I noticed in terms of play out of the middle for Geelong is that Toby Conway had some direct ruck work that led to multiple goals. His hits are getting smarter and smarter. You know, the hit out numbers strongly favored Richmond and Toby Nankervis. Shocker. I Hit outs were 58-27 Richmond, but clearances 45-38 Geelong, which I need to find a half-by-half -half breakdown of clearances because it definitely tilted. For what it's worth, I thought Conway did a pretty good job, and i still rather have him out there than Reese Stanley, although I wouldn't be entirely opposed to giving Stanley the Grundy matchup this week just because I don't know how Conway would fare against a more mobile guy like Grundy that you've really got to deal with all over the ground. Uh I'm glad the losing streak is over. I still wanted like a 130 point win, but I will again feel a lot better if Richmond gives the Crows a tough time. But it was just nice to see actually getting some clearances and then to actually finish off a comeback with things like Zach Tuohy, who looks old and close to done, still making big fourth quarter plays like every week. I think back to the three goal game against Carlton. This is kind of just maybe he should just be our super sub at this point. Said it a couple minutes ago, that's another piece that you could move around in order to make way for the guys that you like and that I like. It should obviously be in like Parfit and Hardy and at some point O'Sullivan. Speaking of Irish, O'Sheen Mullen, I love his upside. I think what his career has done, he might be on like a best 22 of all time players board in Ireland. He is not there yet, and I don't want to keep flinging him into the lineup. Just give him steady time in the twos until he's ready to be there for good, because there's no way he should be getting the spot over someone like a Mitch Hardy. Uh, Shannon Neal, he remembered how to use his hand. He did it. Do you leave this game more encouraged by the second half or disappointed by the first and wondering why the list looked the way it did? Because against oh. any team other than the bottom two, Geelong would not have won this game with the quality first half they put up. I think they still would have won at home against the Eagles. On the road, they would have been fucked. I think they still could have beaten them in Perth against this week's Eagles team, given the outs. But against 15 out of 18 teams, the Cats lose this game. Probably. Again, talk to me after we see what Richmond does against the Crows. Uh, also, they overcame a really rough night for Brian Myers. 25% uh, disposal efficiency. Yeah. He just didn't have it. And for the team to overcome that, that is good. Uh, six turnovers on just 12 disposals. I'm his biggest fan. I'm your number one fan. I'm your number one fan. But yeah, he had a bad game. And the team overcame that, so that's good. Uh, they finally got the ball to Close more in the second half, which I literally every week at some point I will yell to get the ball to Brad Close more. 
do we need to post a thank you for changing my life thing again? Uh, someone did that with Jack Bowes, actually. Yeah, a new version. I think Brad Close is still the right one. He made a big difference, and I'm just not going to go back and watch the first half again because I've had to go through a bunch of these first halves over the last few weeks. Watching the second half was encouraging. There are still problems that need to get addressed, but I'm glad those problems are being addressed in a win rather than a loss. I still cannot exit this game as a third party with much optimism for Geelong, considering who they've got coming up next and how they started. Win one of the two games sandwiched around the bye. Just one of those two. And I will feel really good because that means you either beat Sydney on the road or you beat Carlton again. Then I will believe, okay, there's light at the end of the tunnel. We demand to be taken seriously. Uh, This just came up. This seems relevant. I know you were unimpressed with some of the Eagles defense this week. Other than what, Barris and McGovern? Yeah, who's hurt? Oh, no, nobody's hurt. I know, I know you always look at guys who are from the West as possible additions to help the defense. I mentioned Jed Buslinger for a reason. Uh, and I don't think Sam Taylor is going to come home. Nope, seven-year extension. Oh, there you go. Giant for life. Congratulations, Sam Taylor. Congratulations, GWS. I'm glad you get to keep a guy. You know, I want every one of your guys to be interested in owning a small farm or surfing, but or, or fishing. Fishing's a big one, but happy for the Orange team. I'm honestly really happy for Adam Kingsley and Jason McCartney and the Giants for actually being able to retain a player like that because that's something they just haven't been able to do for much of their history, so that's massive for them. You know, I actually used your line um, during this Alice Springs game. Not sure if you saw what I posted. Uh, which line... Does Christian Petraka want to own a small family farm or surf more? Is that because he was one of the only good pieces for Melbourne? Ha <laughs> ha, 7749. Defeated in Alice Springs by Fremantle 22 9, 141. The Demons are now 4 and 6 at Traeger Park. And the Dockers, um, 1 and 0, 1 in a row. And this is their biggest loss since 2016, which I guess pre Simon Goodwin. Yeah, he was already uh, in there as an assistant, but it was while Paul Roos was still the head coach. And it's the first time that they've been out of the eight since the end of 2020. That's on percentage, but wow, we got King's birthday coming up, and that's ninth versus 10th. Frio, uh, I know they put one on the Eagles last year. Yeah, they had the 101-point derby win, but this is not a team that's built just stylistically to even beat the worst teams by more than 40 or 50, typically. So this should be very, very alarming for Melbourne. I mean, I'm looking at the last few seasons. Let's see, they had that win over the Eagles last year. They had a 78-point win over North in 2022. And then they lost to them last year. I don't know the last time. We're going to have to do some digging to find the last time the Dockers put it on like this against what should be an actual quality opponent. Yeah, 2021, their biggest win was 62 over a bad Hawthorne side. They have a 64-point win in 2020 that was over North. But yeah, these these are rare. I would label this as their most crushing win of the Justin Longmere era. And it happened off Melbourne just not being clean with the ball at all. It was not a well-thought-out game from them. They didn't feel the pace well. They moved out of defense before they were set up enough and then slowed things down in the middle. And then they just were not clean by foot at all. The Dockers cleaned up from forward half turnovers repeatedly. It was a massacre. They had 89 points out of getting the ball in the forward half. That was already enough to get somewhat close to a doubling of the Demons' score. The Dockers were also plus 48 points for clearance, plus 24 clearances itself. They were plus... There were plus 35 contested possessions in the front half, which is a very rare magnitude there. I mean, these are decade bests for Frio and decade worst or close to it for Melbourne. And they had some pretty lean times before Paul Roos came in. And I think that was 2014 as well. So the alarms should be sounding throughout the Melbourne camp after this one. You can't just brush this off. You only have one thing to get your asses kicked. It's another to get beat by 92. Again, I can't just write this off under the it happens, you know, like one team's hundredth percentile versus the other team's zeroth percentile. I don't even think this was a hundredth percentile game from the Dockers. I think it was pretty close. They looked 
excellent. And you know what I liked was it wasn't just, and they only had a couple of sequences where they were just like tossing it around the back. They were faster in general. They had overlaps a lot. They just played quickly enough that they prevented Melbourne's defenders from getting the back position in contests that they liked. Stephen May had so little impact because he was forced to play from the front a lot. And even for a guy who's, you know, kind of the central defender, he's not the biggest guy out there. And Josh Tracy and Jai Amos ran rampant. You could add Luke Jackson into that mix as well. Those three players combined to kick 10 goals for. They gave Jackson a bit more ruck time and just played Sean Darcy less, which I think is probably the better mix for now. Honestly, though, I liked what Darcy did against Gone, just using his size. I think Gone got the better of him, but by a small enough margin. Most guys against Max Gone, it's really, you know, a you're just looking to not get run over. There's a very short list and actually outplay him. It feels so crazy that this game went this way because in the first five minutes, the Dockers were out of sorts defensively. The Demons got two quick goals and then everything was flipped on its head. Frio actually were able to set up a bit more defense. I don't know if they just fixed something off of a couple center bounces right away, but it all clicked. And for around 10 minutes in, it was clear to me how this game was going to go. They controlled the ball from the back when they wanted to go uncontested. They did. They were in the plus 40s range for uncontested possession. And that's also what the Brisbane Lions and the West Coast Eagles were against Melbourne as well. The method to beat the Demons is just control the ball and pick your spot from uncontested, but still do it in a timely manner. Know when to accelerate. I did some digging and I found the last couple times the Dockers really put it on quality teams. You got to go back to 2014. They had a 53 point win over Essendon in round four. And 2013, round 22, they had a 74-point win over Port Adelaide. Those are the last two, like, really lopsided wins over, like, finalists that I can find. So what I what I liked about this game from Frio, it wasn't just that they were controlling the ball in the back. You know, they did have a couple of those stretches that, you know, they're pretty boring. And I don't especially enjoy that. They just dominated in every facet. I think... I'm going to go through the roster and find a list of Frio players that I think were better than every Melbourne player in this game. Jai Amos, Bailey Banfield, Andrew Brayshaw, Heath Chapman, Jordan Clark, maybe Joshua Draper, uh, maybe not five, definitely Luke Jackson, Jager O'Meara, who's played really well lately, Alex Pierce, maybe Luke Ryan, I mean, high, num- high volume, but low impact, Caleb Sarong, Jeremy Sharp, Sam Sturt, Sam Switkowski, Josh Tracy, Brandon Walker, maybe Michael Walters, and definitely Hayden Young. So that's a definite 15. Yeah, that's not good. Um, I really liked this forward mix. And, you know, I definitely you want to get, I mean, he's sort of a forward. Matthew Johnson, I'd like to, you know, I'd like him to get back in. Tom Emmett was also out. I like Emmett. I like this group with Sam Sturt more, and I'd like to see more of Sturt. I think he's a good mix of marking ability and kind of dynamic stuff and mobility. It was nice seeing him and Sonny Walters playing together because usually it's been Sturt coming in when Walters has been managed, and that's not exactly like for like. Can I start the Josh Tracy All-Australian Dark Horse campaign? I honestly think a couple people in America have probably started that before us on the Cyclones' behalf. It's not just 11 marks. It's that he's doing it outside of the forward 50. Three goals, three assists. This was really good. It makes me think of why we've liked some of the full field stuff from Jeremy Cameron and to a lesser extent, Jake Waterman. And I guess Harry McKay could even fall under that umbrella as well. Jesse Hogan as well. Just these tall forwards who are capable of goal kicking, but know they've got so much else to offer and don't have to be the main target. I mean, he's not the main target. Jai Amos is probably the main target as young as he is, but Tracy is probably the more important player structurally. I was very happy for Amos to have his bounce back game after he cost them two points last. He also cost them six points in this game. But I don't even remember that. This was mid-second quarter. Was there like a, oh, was a downfield free or a reversal or something? Nope. It was just a quick quarter passage. He got a mark from Nat Fife. Tried to be unselfish for Bailey Banfield, and he threw it. Like, no, that should have been your shot. First off, 
And if you're going to dispose of it, you should probably, I don't know, actually uh, dispose of the ball, probably. Just an idea, just a suggestion. Thrilled that he got his confidence back there. When he hit a set shot, that's when you knew, all right, things are looking good. Midfield, mostly the same cast. What, Sarong, Brayshaw, Young, I guess Fife. Uh, I think this game broke champion data because Nat Fife was the best rated player on ground. I mean, he was at 90% efficiency, but I didn't think he did anything that transformative, even with good contested possession numbers. And then the second best ranked player was Jack Viney somehow. And then a whole bunch more Dockers. Maybe it's just an Alice Springs thing. Maybe it's a champion data thing. I don't know. But this this team is hard to comprehend. I love what Jake Robira and Sam Switkowski have been able to bring the past two, three weeks in the midfield and half forward mix. Obira finally getting some consistent time in the 22. And to nobody's surprise, it's working. Switkowski was pretty much everything in the second half. I think his third quarter was one of the two or three best third quarters this week. Then I'll say that. And then in defense, Alex Pierce didn't have all that much in terms of possessions, but made an impact in every contest that came within, what, three meters of him. But we're kind of used to that at this point. And the few times he had the ball were centered around kind of that sequence between late in the first quarter and the second quarter where they really blew this margin out. It's what? They were down 13 to zero for the rest of the half, outscored the D's 71 to eight. And Pierce was involved in that 71 to eight window. But why does the Dockers defense just look so much more sound these past few weeks? Fast up. Yeah, I think you highlighted him last week or two weeks ago. It's my turn now. Heath Chapman is my guy here, and he completes the Dockers' defensive structure. They are 2-3 and three without him and are 4-1-1 one and one with him and honestly should be 5-1 and one with him. He completes their defensive structure. He roves smartly. He's a surprisingly clean handball. Anybody on the East Coast who hasn't watched him closely before, now's your time to learn something about him now that he's healthy you can really tell the difference i also thought this was brandon walker's best game of the year another one without like crazy high disposal numbers but just a really effective player and i think he's been shaky for a lot of this year i think this was definitely the best we've seen out of him also uh the siren in alice springs sounds really weird it's like two different horns and i don't know it's it's strange were they using the train horn I don't know. I did suggest it. All right. Final game of this round. I have not watched this game in full yet. I have kind of watched a quarter and a half or so and not super closely. But Gold Coast 14-7-91 defeating Essendon 11-14-80. The mighty sun. I know this was a very well attended game. 21,759. It's the fourth highest ever attendance at Carrara. And the second highest this year, because opening round actually had an even greater number. A lot of Essendon fans there. I think the crowd ended up actually pretty even, though, and I'm hoping that it can look that good for Q Clash as well, although we'll probably be disappointed. What was the ratio? Was it like a 50-50 mix or a little bit better in the Suns' favor? I think probably 50-50 was the best the Suns could have done. All right, so probably slightly better than like the Collingwood game a year or two ago. Definitely better than the Collingwood game a year or two ago. That was probably 60-40 at least. All right. Even with some people not being able to make that one as far as I recall, I think there were like flights that were canceled. Ethan, you said you were unable to really get into this game in the first half. I can say the second half was definitely more gripping. So I want to go through this game by just asking you some questions because I don't know. Uh, I'm going to assume Rowell, Anderson, and Miller were better than... Merritt, Durham, and Perkins, or Caldwell, or whichever group you want to associate. I would put Caldwell in there, and Perkins maybe being one of the next guys outside. Caldwell is always present on the ground and always sweating up a storm, of course. But Noah Anderson had probably the best second quarter on ground, and Raul was the best contested player in the second half. So many times I noticed him managing to get the ball out of congestion and to the Suns' advantage. Just a very typical Matt Rowell game, and damn, it's fun to watch. 13 contested, 11 tackles, 8 clearances, gained nearly half a kilometer and 41 pressure acts. It's just, it's Matt Rowell being Matt Rowell. Um, 
take notes, I guess, because that's what he does. And also Noah Balta was shown doing that in, I think, the second quarter on Saturday night. When the game was there to be won, because Essendon had tied it up a couple times in the earlier part of the fourth quarter, but Rao was there to tough out some center clearances, and Anderson got an important one as well. Those two play really well off each other, no surprise considering they've played with each other for a long time, and it's scary to think that they've got so much of their best footy ahead of them still. Who are the less obvious players that were big contributors to this game on both sides? Less obvious? Well, I think in defense, you'll definitely notice Bodie Euland as a strong roving defender. He had more of a roving role in the first half and a steadier defensive job in the second. Ended up with 13 marks there. Never the foremost player in defense for them. Not yet. That would probably be Sam Collins at this point. And Collins had another very strong game as well in his normal spots. But Euland has grown into this year really nicely. I wouldn't be shocked if he picks up a Rising Star nomination very soon, or has he already? You will definitely notice in the second half, Nick Cox. I wonder if he could have some ability sort of as a swingman between 50s, especially if Kyle Langford's hip injury keeps him out, because after that, Cox managed to go forward again and ended up with three goals total. I think just being a left footer kind of threw off Gold Coast defenders a bit for some of those defensive matchups. He fooled Mac Andrew, which is becoming harder and harder to do. Aside from not kicking straight, what's the biggest reason Essendon lost? Because I know they had more scoring shots. I mean, I think it was because Raul and Anderson did the job they needed to do in the final three quarters, and you really noticed it from some of the key wins in the second half in particular. Tuke Miller was pretty chaotic with 10 turnovers, but was there when he needed to be as well. And th this was an entertaining watch, but if you focused on these teams for the first 11 rounds... I think you'll kind of understand where the game was won and lost. I think there was a real chance for Essendon to grab momentum in the middle of the third quarter. And Essendon did get a couple goals after this. But Nick Martin should have had an easy goal and slammed a ball into the left post. I think he just overdid the kick. And with how up for grabs the game was for a while, I just thought back to that moment. A lot of thought that Essendon could have done more in the third quarter. I mean, obviously they could have when they kicked two goals, five. But the third quarter was a chance where they really could have grabbed more momentum. And instead, they lost the quarter. And the Suns ran through the middle fairly easily for a good portion of this game, which you wouldn't expect against Essendon. Maybe one of the weaker defensive games from some of their midfield pieces. I didn't notice it as much on the defensive end from Zach Merritt. And they managed to stay away from Sam Durham a decent amount. So I, I think they just knew which players to avoid. And they worked well as a team to spot those players and then kind of navigate around them. So the big question, is it Essendon or Frauds? Is it the Suns or God at home? Right now, I want to say the Suns are God at home. If the Blues win convincingly on Sunday, my tone may change. Because Gold Coast have strategies here that could be repeated, things that could be replicated. The support behind the ball and a lot of forward half intercepts in the middle quarters, that's replicable. Having this defensive mix develop where Mac Andrew and Bodie Euland are getting more prominent roles, that's replicable. It's a matter of doing it away from People First Stadium and away from Darwin. The Saints this week is a massive opportunity to finally make that happen. That's actually... A huge game, now that I think about it. Because I still believe the Saints aren't completely out of it, which, again, my rationale for that is simply, I never get them right. I know I should believe they're finished, but I think this is more a prove-it game for the Suns than anything. Almost a full round coming up here this week with just the Dockers and Power going on in buys. The latter of those teams needs it more than the former. I love that we get this where even with eight games, we don't have any overlaps. Well, you got a holiday around which things could be spaced out and know how big of a fan we are of Sunday night footy. It's a Sunday night banger and a good Monday game. I am very excited for what this round could potentially bring to the table. All right, uh, your week 11 mark winner was Chad Warner in a pack when I, we thought it should have been Lechelier. Did You thought it was 
it should have been Alir as well, right? I do believe Alir should have had the win, given the combination of the time in the game and the turning mark that he had. I know that fans value contact in marks. Alir's was a case where even though there wasn't contact, there was a lot to like. I mean, there wasn't necessarily contact, but there was stuff that was like affected by other people. This week's batch isn't quite as good. It's not bad, but nothing that memorable. Uh, Jack McBray kind of following the flight of the ball back and taking one between Brayden Mannard and Steele side bottom. People always like guys going back following the flight of the ball. I wouldn't be shocked if McRae wins it. Mason Wood over Ruben Jimby and a giant Spark over Michael Walters and Tom McDonald that should not have been paid. He did not bring it to the ground. That would definitely not be a catch in any level of American football. Well, you don't have to have an American football catch to have an Australian football mark, but no, it shouldn't have been paid. And that's why I don't want to vote for it. I think my vote's going to go to Mason Wood for the actual kind of one-on-one work that he did. I'm also going to go with Mason Wood. Your round 11 goal of the week went to Dustin Martin for his pocket goal after working a 1-2 with Kane McAuliffe. We both preferred a goal that wasn't even nominated, that being a Bailey Humphrey goal. Your nominees this week, the suspended Sam Darcy. He smothered Darcy more on one end and then had a tough pocket goal on the other. I think the full field sequence there is what's going to help him there. Then on Sunday, Caleb Sorong got a Sam Swakowski handball and had a check side kick for the pocket. We know that he's got that check side capability. You think back to what he did a couple years ago for goal of the year. Thank goodness Hutto did not repeat his Sorong so right call. And then Ben Ainsworth in the Twilight game took a Bailey Humphrey kick on a bounce and wheeled way around to snap on a tough angle. I like Ainsworth a lot, even though it was in the open field. I think I'm going to go with Ainsworth as well. I think there was enough degree of difficulty to it that it became pretty fun. And there was it was definitely the highest individual effort. I th- the others were neat, like full plays and good setups. And I did really like that's the wrong one. But I think Ainsworth wins there in terms of just like wow factor. Uh, main character from the start of the round, I really was hoping that it would have been the did someone say KFC sign from Collingwood? Because that's the sort of silly thing that we're always a fan of. Saturday, though, gave us a couple other candidates. You want to know another reason why the West Coast and Saints game had some sickos vibes. It's because Aussie the Eagle, the West Coast live wedge-tailed eagle mascot, who has a massive wingspan and is just huge in general, she did not go back to her handlers right away. It perched herself by the home coach's box. That nearly delayed warm-ups. I wonder if Auburn University fans could relate at all. Uh... What about James Paxton? Ooh, that too. That is one of the funnier things that's ever happened. An eagle just sitting on James Paxton's shoulder. The national bird of America sitting on a Canadian dude. I mean, eagles sit on trees and his nickname is Big Maple. And you do get a lot of them in British Columbia. I believe he's a BC native. I think so. Yeah, he's from the Vancouver area. And going north of Vancouver, you do get a lot of bald eagles there. We've seen them. And then I think there's a strong chance that Harley Reid could actually get a second main character win of the year because his suspension and rising star eligibility, or lack thereof now, became the talk of the league. I think Harley Reid's probably going to win this. I'm not sure if there are other nominations we could give. Yeah, I think there's just been already so much discourse about, you know, should a suspension take you out of candidacy for rising star? I don't think it should. I'm not going to argue this at length because literally everyone else is, and we'd like to give you something different whenever possible. Well, I think the main character vote will sway in his favor and might prompt a tad more of that conversation from us. Hopefully not too much. For seven games, there was a lot to talk about this week. So thank you to those of you who stuck around for the entirety of this episode. We'll be back with you pretty soon because we've got our Route 13 preview, but also our progress reports and our Sir Duck Nichols jumper rankings to do. That's something that we have done the past couple years, and it's just the right time to do it with only a couple teams on by. You know the drill. We're on a bunch of social media platforms at American Spuddy. I'm at Benjamin HK01. He's at Castle Media. His son is at Cat Named Brian on Instagram, and I don't think he actually wreaked nearly as much havoc as we expected. Oh no, he was he was having fun at the start. He's he's settled down. Well, hopefully he'll settle down as we both get to sleep here soon because we tend to record pretty late. 
Good night or good whatever time it is, everybody. <laughs>